Good evening, church family. We uh, have uh, just a few things that uh, we want to talk about tonight, but we want to do a panel discussion uh, with uh, Blake and Mandy, and I uh, hope you enjoy it, and uh, um, really, we just kind of want to share our heart tonight. So let's pray real quick, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get started with a panel discussion. Father, we are uh, so thankful that we can come and uh, just... Uh, ask some questions and, and just share our hearts with our church family. And, and Lord, I just pray that, Lord, that uh, you would just continue to work in our community. Uh, Father, we just pray for all those that are sick, all those that are in pain tonight. Uh, Father, we just ask that your hand of just be on them and comfort them. And, and uh, Lord God, just wrap your arms around them. Father, we pray for our church family as we, um, Father, are still just a few weeks away of, of meeting back together. Uh, Father, we miss one another. We miss each other. And, and Lord, we just are, are praying for the days um, as we uh, are just trying to meet back together, Lord. And just, uh, Father, we just pray for your hand upon everything that we do, Father, that it just glorify you, Father. Again, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. How are you guys? I'm good. 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 Awesome. Well, better than I deserve. Oh, that's even better. So, well, we have... Um, on this panel discussion, we just have a few questions that uh, we want to ask each other and, and uh, kind of go from there. But uh, the first question, we'll just throw it out there. Where has you where have you seen God working in your life in the past few weeks? So if you want to go first. Well, a uh, couple of things that really stand out to me uh, as far as where I've seen God working is where he's been connecting us with people through COVID-19 and our response to that and where we've been able to connect with people, uh, I still kind of get goosebumps yeah. over the uh, Easter egg hunt sure. and the families and seeing the responses from people and the families who have uh, begun to get involved with our online opportunities and have already contacted us about wanting to get involved after the fact and uh, that has really excited me yeah and so uh, i think i'd say that would be the biggest one it's awesome awesome mandy what about you where have you where have you seen god working in your life in the past few weeks i would say in three different ways i'm not always the most patient yeah, of people absolutely so i think that god has definitely taught me patience and that my pace needs to kind of slow down a bit and it's yeah. okay to 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 take some breaths and um and to be still um i also think that my priorities it's kind of allowed me to take some time and, and reevaluate where i've put my priorities and and what priorities need to shift and what priorities need to remain at the top of the list um, and I think, thirdly, it's also kind of helped me um, see things from a new perspective. Um, I'm kind of a concrete thinker, a black and white kind of right and wrong. And, and I think through all of this, I've been, God's really convicted me and has been just pushing me to see things through his eyes and to love people and show grace to people um, because everyone reacts to this differently because their circumstances are different and their perspective is different. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me on that aspect, I've seen God work just personally in my life um, about how I've slowed down a little bit, taken that deep breath. Um, Bible study, you know, it's always been important to me and in my prayer life's always been important. But just now I'm starting to see God just moving a little differently in my Bible studies. And, and it's kind of like, man, this has been, been really nice. So... But, uh, all right, well, let's look at number two here. What gives you the most hope for the future? For me, I mean, I know this sounds like the churchy answer. Oh, I don't know. Well, that might help. There we go. I know it sounds like the churchy answer uh, to say Jesus, yeah. but really it is. Uh, but expressly, it has been... Uh, what Jesus has been doing during this time. It has been the hope that I see from the things that he's doing. Yeah. When I see him move, when I see him uh, impact someone's life, when I get to be a part of that, uh, those things always tell me, it doesn't matter how bad it is, it doesn't matter 
how tired uh, or stressed I may get, uh, there's still hope. Sure. And it's not just hope like, well, things will turn out good because I just think things will turn out good. It's this real genuine hope that we receive from our relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and because I'm seeing him do so much in our students' lives, and in my in my own kids' lives, of course, I've seen a lot more of my kids lately. So uh, getting to really see what God's doing in their lives too. Yeah, I, I was going to say one of the things that I, I, I've been thinking about, you know, about future hope is is you know, and, and I said it I said it um, just the other day to somebody I was talking to about just seeing how God has been faithful in in everything that's been happening, and and you know, again, you know, that's our that's our theme for. Um, 2020 is, is is faithful and you know with those bracelets and everything we talk about but but I was stuck into somebody the other day and, and I was just like if you start in Genesis and you read all the way through the Bible to Revelation you, you kind of see that word faithful about how faithful God is and and that has just really kind of given me hope in, in that aspect of, 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 of looking at it going God no matter what we go through you're always faithful and, and, you know, just as I've been preaching through Psalms and I've been looking at that and, and I've been reading Psalms and, and, and it's like, okay, here's David. And I've kind of put myself in David's perspective. And, and I thought, man, you know, here is a man that just like last week found himself in a cave. He writes these Psalms. He's just, you know, probably thinking death to the point, you know, I'm just going to die in this cave. You know, they're going to find me. But God, I'm going to praise you. And, and that's what gives me future. The hope is, is and this is what's taught, this is something that has taught me is, is no matter what, you know, the future is bright because of who my trust is in. And that's what I've, I've learned about, you know, being, you know, gives me hope for the future is, is God, you've just been faithful. You're going to be faithful. No matter what happens, you're always going to be faithful. So when we talk about hope um, in this context, endurance yeah. and enduring hope is, is something that just really comes to, to my mind because we we're all going to be, we're all going through this storm it's affecting us all differently and right. and and some of the storms are, are much more mighty and the winds are much more mighty for others but what assurance do we have and what just hope that we know who wins the victory in the end and we don't have to fear that. Like it, there's just like this grounding that hope gives us, and we're not tossed to and fro like Ephesians says. You know, we're we're grounded in in that hope. That's good, and, and I think that's something you know for even our church family um, to think about too during this time is 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 you know what gives you the most hope for the future. Um, you know, maybe it's something that that you've looked at lately, but. But I think that's something that we could ask ourselves, even as a church family, is, is what's our future look like? You know, what's our future look like as, as a Christian? What's our future look like as a church? What's our future look like, you know, next year or whatever? Our, our future really ought to be, and I'll say it like this, our future ought to be dictated on what the Word of God says. And, and I think that's where our future ought to be. Um, aligned with of saying you know that's where my hope that's where my faith that's where you know when we're tossed to and fro like you said in Ephesians that's where our future lies is with God so that's good stuff so all right number three in difficult times in your life have you felt closer or farther from God and why do you think that is well for me um, really the answer is yes <laughs> yeah. uh, I've done both and uh, but the thing that has really stood out in both of those times is it it was directly tied to my pursuit of Jesus Christ um, when I was actively having a prayer life and actively studying the Word of God not just for lessons but for a, an actual relationship with Him then when the hard times came. Um, there was uh, th there was hope. I felt closer to him. I felt like there was a reason. Uh, but when I wasn't listening, when I was allowing the storms, when I was allowing the difficulties to look bigger than God, 
then when they kind of exploded, I stayed with them. And I said, okay, you're in charge, you're in control. And gave myself over to those storms. And um, I know that sounds churchy, but I, I, the reason it sounds churchy is because it sounds biblical. Right. Is that's, that's where God is calling us to be, is to pursue Him. And if we just kind of step back and do the simple, am I pursuing Him? Because if I'm not, then the storms are going to take us down a place where we have no hope. Right, and I think that's that's with all of us, um, and and I'll speak, you know, for me, but um, for all of us, I think we we get to this point in life where we we've kind of got in this routine. I'll, I'll put it like this: we get in this routine where, yeah, every morning at six o'clock, I'm I'm reading the Bible, and and I'm reading it just because that's what I have to do. Um, and then I, I have to pray and I have this list that I pray over and, and, and okay, then check, check, check. And, and then, you know, when I get around somebody, man, things are good, God's good, but I'm going through something difficult. And I think in that difficulty time, God is trying to teach us something about how am I really focusing on God or am I just focusing on what I need to focus on? And, and, I, and I'd say for me, I think a lot of, a lot of Christians go through life living their life thinking that, man, I've just done everything right that God asked me to do. And then we find ourselves in a situation like Jonah. You know, hey, I'm the problem. Throw me over. And until we really get to that point of saying, okay, God, I'm in this difficulty. And sometimes I may have put myself in that difficult spot. God, I'm crying out to you. Um, again, I think, you know, you look at the disciples. When Jesus told the disciples, y'all go on over uh, on the other side of the sea. And, and Jesus stayed and prayed. They found themselves in a difficulty. Then what did they do? They cried out to God more. Let us not be Christians that just cry out to God when we get in that storm. Help us to do that before we get in the storm so that when we're in the storm, what we do is focus more on God than we do the storm. Easy said, hard to do. And, and, and I think that's where, for me, that's another thing. Go back to number two there. What gives you the most hope for the future is, is that's one of the things that I've been learning is, is, is even as I've said, easy said, hard to do, that God's teaching me in the midst of a storm. What are we looking at? And God's taught me over that over the last several weeks, especially just being, you know, alone and, and, and just kind of just being focused on him. I love to. You know, I've said this over and over again, but I love just sitting outside. I mean, yesterday was 106. I think I probably got 35, 40 minutes in. I did not sit outside yesterday. My gosh, it was miserable. <laughs> I'm sitting out there going, God, I want to spend time with you, but I'm dying right now. Uh, our, our Monday, Monday it was 106. I mean, it was just brutal. And, and, but I'm looking forward to going, you know, outside the next couple of days and just sitting out there. But, but I, I read scripture and I, you know, I, I journal in, in my notebooks and, and I'm sitting down and I'm thinking, God, help me no matter what I go through to keep my eyes focused on you. And, and, and that kind of in difficult times in your life, I felt close to God, but I've also felt far from God. Because, you know, just as I, I, I kind of, again, I'll quote David on that, you know, be gracious to me, O oh God. You know, Psalms 56, Psalms 57, he said that over and over again. I've got to the point where I'm like, okay, God, be gracious to me, but by golly, get me out of this. What are you trying to do in the midst of that? God's trying to teach us something. And so that's, you know, I felt, you know, Blake, I think you've kind of said that too, like both. I've been in both situations, you know, and I'm not trying to give the church answer, but I think every Christian has been there. And if you hadn't been there, you, 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 you might want to check something because you're probably not looking around hard enough. So, yeah. Mandy, what do you got? I'll have to say that um, I agree. Both is my answer. When I mean, I went through a season where I was mad and bitter. I mean, oh my goodness, I could probably stay on here for an hour, which I won't, talking about my 19th year on this planet and just how crazy it was and, and all the things that I went through. And instead of leaning into God, I grew very bitter and very angry and very self-centered in uh, 
what I loved most about that is he never stopped pursuing me through other people and, and, and just trying to continue to tell me, hey, I'm here. Um, and, and then through other difficulties and seasons, um, like you guys said, you know, if, if, if I'm leaning into him and he's my strength, just kind of like that analogy that you have used before, Blake, then I don't have those mirrored glasses on. And I'm not just seeing myself. I'm seeing, oh my goodness, this is how God is using this to minister or to chip away at those rough spots in my own life or um, you know that the the branch analogy, where if 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 the branch is attached to the to the vine, then the branch is going to be able to sway with the wind. And if the branch is not attached, in and it, it it's going to be dead. And when the wind comes, it's going to be brittle and it's going to break. That's good. That's real good. So. Yeah, man, that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I like that analogy. I might have to steal that. So. All right, number four here. Who is one person you think God put in your life for a reason? And if you want to share, what do you think that reason is? Oh, you're going to let me go first. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <Yeah. laughs> Mix it up a little Put bit. Me on the spot. Thanks. Yeah. Love you too. Um, so, not within my my family, because I am really blessed. I mean, I love my little four pack, and my extended family is 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 phenomenal. But outside of that, I have two ladies. I have Miss Didi and I have Miss Tammy. And they are both older than me, um, but they have been in my life for about 15 years. And they, they encourage me, they mentor me, they pray with me, um, they let me cry when I need to, and they tell me to stop when I'm just being selfish and silly. Um, I feel like I've grown so much under their, their mentorship and God gave them to me at a time when I moved away from family and I had a little baby and, and, uh, and they just stepped in and, and just, oh, just loved and gave me grace that I didn't, I very much didn't deserve at the time. And they loved me when I was young and dumb, that's for sure. And so I, I think I'll answer that, Blake, and then we'll let you kind of go last. But uh, I, I've got a pastor buddy of mine named Chad. Um, man, we give each other a hard time. But, but I think God um, put him in my life for a purpose and a reason. Um, I remember the first church that I pastored. He was, uh, he was at the church across town. And, and uh, I remember introduced, he introduced himself to me one day. And, and I thought, oh, he seems like a nice guy. You know, and, and, and I just know how some pastors are. Some pastors be like, okay, yeah, that's about as far as it goes. But, uh, but he, he seemed to take an interest in me as a young pastor. Um, and, and this has been going on for, golly, almost, almost uh, I've been a pastor now for like 17 years. And so it's been going on for 17 years. And so, um, but for me, like Chad's one that, you know, we talk almost every day. Uh, but we sit down at the end of the week and we kind of, you know, hey, how's your week been? You know, what, what, what are you facing? You know, hey, where are you struggling at? You know, and, and we've kind of you know, built this relationship where, um, you know, it's, it's not transparent, but it's, it's, it's a real one. And, and it's one of them deals, man, where I can call him up at any given time and say, man, I'm struggling right here. Man, I need you to pray. And he's going to do that. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, that has really been there for me. And I know in my previous church, I mean, he would drive down and see me, you know, and, and you know, and then now it's kind of like, you know, we have to meet halfway somewhere. But, um, but yeah, God put him in there, I think, to, to one, to mentor me, to show me and to help me, you know, keep moving forward in ministry and don't just, don't just settle for, for what you got, keep moving forward. So, um, so God put Chad in my life for that reason, I think, so. Well, for me, uh, the one that stood out to me is someone that God put in your life for a reason, uh, and talking mentors and stuff. He would never qualify himself as a mentor to me, and we did not get to spend a lot of time together. But uh, Richard Ross is a professor at Southwestern Seminary. Uh, he created True Love Waits. He is... Uh, one of the pioneers of the family ministry movement, but I was taking a couple classes at the end of my time at seminary, and uh, 
we found out that Mandy was pregnant with Elijah, and uh, in one of the tests, it came back, and we were told that it looked like Elijah was going to have Down syndrome. And so that kind of puts everything in a whole new direction, and what are we going to be doing, and what does our life look like in that perspective? And uh, Dr. Ross, uh, his son has several medical conditions, and they went through some stuff uh, during pregnancy as well. And when I mentioned it as a prayer request in the group, um, he stopped me after class and kept me for a, a long time yeah. and really wanted to talk through it with us. And he, uh, he said, you know, my, my wife and I, we want to have you and your wife down for dinner and we want to talk and we want to just invest in you and uh, reached out and uh, we felt it was an absolute answer uh, of prayer from God uh, not that we wouldn't have loved him or anything any different, but in the sense that uh, we found out later that uh, he was not going to have Down syndrome. But for a few months there, that was a real perspective of our life that we were looking yeah. at. And uh, mm. in a time that I was, I was afraid, how am I going to be able to be an effective dad? How am I going to be what I need to be for him? And... Uh, he reached out and was there for me and uh, still, I mean, you know how many thousands of students roll through his classes on a regular basis. I have not been in a class with him in 12 years and I come into a conference or I see him, it's been two years since the last time I see him, I walk into a conference and he's like, Blake, how are you doing? Calls me over and we're talking and uh, he's always uh, been there for me and uh, so just a real blessing. Well, I, I, I think, too, like number four there, who, who's that one person that you think God put in your life for a reason? And number five kind of goes along with that. Who is a person of faith that you look up to and inspires you? Uh, I mean, those, those questions kind of go hand in hand, I think. But, I mean, do you all have anybody different on those? I'm going to turn down that just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I, I, you know, personally, I, I'd say for me, um, those are those are both the same person for me. I think Chad's that guy that inspires me. He uh, he's a guy that I look up to, and so. But I mean, if y'all have anybody different, the only person I would or a couple of people that I would mention, I've got uncles on both sides of my family, um, both by marriage. One of them um, passed away this last summer. My uncle Rich, and he was boisterous, and you couldn't sit in a room with him without him making sure that Jesus was part of the conversation. He prayed fervent prayers and and um, would sing with just so much joy in his heart. And it was just so genuine. And at his funeral, they had his Bibles and his prayer journals and his devotionals laid out on a table. And it inspired me so much because I always knew that I admired him, but I didn't know the depth of his faith and the depth of his walk until I I saw those and, and was able to go, oh my goodness, would they be able to do that at my funeral? You know, what would what would I be as as genuine in my faith as this man was? And then on my other side is my uncle Carl, and he is the exact opposite as far as he is very a gentle giant. He hardly says a word. Um, he he's a, a hard worker, but his faith is resolute, and it is constant, um, and it's just he loves people in his in his actions. I mean, he just has this servant heart that just really really inspires me. Um, someone that has really been standing out to me lately is. Uh, his name's Weston Young. He is a youth pastor at Rock Creek Baptist in Shawnee. And uh, he is somebody who we've been working with on and off since he was in college at OBU and working at Falls Creek on the security patrol. Um, but uh, we've, been, we've gotten connected with him. But the thing that inspires me the most about Weston is his excitement and his passion both for student ministry and for 
God, just for and the Word of God, and and desiring to pursue that depth of relationship and that depth of knowledge, and to see the excitement on him whenever, whenever I have that moment where I'm like, I, I kind of just want to take a break, or I'm like, man, this just didn't do it for me. I'm a man. I, I need uh, and I'll get a call and he'll be telling me about something that's going on at his church. And it may even not even be something good. He may be dealing with something, but just to hear his passion to uh, pour into people and to see the church be the church that God's called it to be, uh, to just kind of puts me right back in this. That's right. That's what we're doing. That's why we're doing it. Exactly. That, that's exactly right. So, all right, moving on here. What advice would you give a new Christian? I thought this was a very good question because I think as a church family, I think we could help you in a way that, you know, because I know especially my answer, um, my answer would be, and I'll answer this first, but what advice would I give a new Christian would be not only as a pastor, but hey, how can I come beside you and help you? Mm -hmm. You know, Colossians um, 2.7, um, or 2.6, I think it's 2.7, no, it's 2.7 that says that, that we need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. And so... My advice to a new Christian is, is not just pat them on the back, say, man, we're proud of you. We're going to be praying for you. But to take that step now and go, hey, I want to, to help you become a disciple that in three, four years later down the road, you can actually take somebody now and make a disciple. You know, because I think that's what God wants. And so my advice to a new Christian is, is how can I come beside you and help you and get you deeper in the word of God so that you understand it so that two things don't happen. One. They don't get burnt out and leave the church. Um, because I think as most churches, the back door is bigger than the front door. They're leaving the church faster than what they're coming in. And the second thing is, is we want to make sure about their, their true salvation. You know what I mean? As Baptists, we believe in what, what the Bible says. I mean, it's full of, you know, once you're saved, you're always saved. But the older I think people get, they start doubting that salvation because... They're not rooted in the Word of God. And so when they come to church and they sit there, I mean, I remember I had a 70-year-old lady one time that told me, she said, I don't have what that person has. I don't have that joy. I don't have that. And it was because they were so worried about church members than they were about true, true, true Christians and true disciples. And she said, when I went down to the church and gave my life to Jesus, she said, the guy didn't ask me. She said, the pastor at that time, I think it was like 1940-something, she said, he didn't ask me, do you want to come know Jesus? She said, fill this out and become a member of the church. Well, we don't need members of churches. What we need is we need disciples of churches. And so I guess for me, one of the advices that I'd give is, is how can I come beside you and help you to grow deeper in the Word of God so that we can move forward, so we can make a difference in the world because the church is full of Christians that really haven't made an impact in the world. Yeah. So what we need is more disciples to make an impact in the world. That's what I would give a give advice to. So. Yeah. I think um, for me, an analogy that I like to use is a lamp is only effective if, if it's plugged in. Absolutely. And if, if, if you're never going to plug in, then you're never going to really have the purpose that you were created for. And as a Christian, uh, we're, cre we're created to go out and be that light. And in order to have that light, we've, we've got to be connected. I would also say never be afraid to ask tough questions. There is not one question that you can ask that's going to intimidate God. He wants you to pursue him and to work out your faith. And have those people, like Shane said, have those people that will walk beside you, that will help disciple you, lead you, shape you, and hold you accountable. Because there are times in your life where you need to be taught and, and where, where you need to be um, shaped. And that's not always fun. Um, but it's always necessary. So don't don't run away when when someone holds you accountable, and don't run away from the church or from your relationship with Christ when you have questions. Press in, lean in during those times. Plug in. Absolutely. Um, I know it's another analogy, but for me, is looking at salvation as a journey, and. Uh, Coming to know Christ as your Lord and Savior is the first step, not the last step. Mm -hmm. um, we take the journey of coming to know Him, but then we take the journey of knowing Him better. And, uh, you know, that journey, as uh, Paul said, you know, I, I run the race of perseverance 
for the prize set before me. Well, what's the prize set before me? He's already saved. He's already got a relationship yeah. with Jesus. So the prize set before him is not coming to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. The prize set before him is glorification in eternity with heaven, in heaven with God. And so we are constantly on that journey. And so the biggest thing is don't treat salvation as the last step. Treat it as that first baby step. And exactly what you were saying was uh, now get those people that are going to uh, encourage you and build you up and let them in. You know, a lot of times we've spent our whole life closed off oh, yeah, and we've spent our whole life being in charge of our own ways. I mean, that's for me, all sin really comes down to pride. It's all an outpouring of us wanting what we want. And when we can step back from that and we can say it's no longer about what I want, it's about what he wants. Right. And because it's about what he wants, I have to let down those walls and I have to quit trying to guard myself and instead let Jesus guard me. Right. So I'm going to let people in. I'm going to love on people. I'm going to love on people to lead them to Christ. And I'm going to love on people as they pour into me yep. in my relationship. And together we're going to move forward and we're going to be the hands and feet that he's called us to be. Yeah, I think to add, add to what you're saying, I think on the other side of that too, you, you see that point where in John 3.30, I mean, one of my, my favorite verses that he must increase and we decrease, I think we come to the point because, I mean, John the Baptist could have been prideful. Yeah. He knew what his forerunner, he knew that he was a forerunner, but he could have been at that point of saying, man, I, I'm, I'm him. I, I'm the Messiah. I'm the guy that's coming, you know, not done anything that Jesus would have done. But I think at that point, he was so humble that he said that he's got to increase while I decrease. And I think as Christians, we've got to get that way. Right. And I think on the other side of that, Paul in Philippians uh, chapter 2, he said, For I have not yet obtained it yet. Mm -hmm. If anybody could have obtained it, if it could have been anybody that would have already had it together, it would have been Paul. I mean, here's a guy at the end of, what is it, Acts 24, 25, 26, where he's, he's, he's desperately wanting to go to Rome. And yet the Spirit has, has, has not led him to go to Rome. And then all of a sudden, I think it's Acts 26, he takes off and he's shipwrecked. You know? And then he's at this place. And he's already been to Philippi. He's you know, on his way to prison. He's on, on his deathbed at this point. And he's saying, hey, I haven't obtained it. Yeah. And I think if, if from what Paul has gone through, that he tells the people at, at, at Philippians, he tells them at, at Philippi, I haven't obtained it. I think... No matter how old we are, no matter how young we are, as, as, as believers, we're not going to obtain it. So yet, let people in, let people come, let people teach us. Because, I mean, I've sat down with people over the last several weeks, and I'm like, I haven't thought of it like that, mm -hmm. you know, in the Bible. I haven't, I haven't thought of that. I haven't thought of this. I haven't seen it that way. And so I've gone away with something different. And, I mean, I could sit there and go, man, I've already obtained it. I've, I've been to seminary. I've, I've learned it. But at the end of that... God's not happy. God wants us to be a continual learner. That's the, that's the whole definition of a disciple, is being a continual learner. So, so I just wanted to add to what you said, because I think that was, that was pretty good stuff. So um, number seven, as we move forward, um, why, why do some people find it so hard to trust God's plan with their lives? I thought this was a good question. Okay, so, so this is really funny, because... What I would say is the answer to that is pride. Absolutely. It's exactly what, yeah. what Blake was t talking about and kind of piggybacking off of that. But it is selfishness. It, you know, like my dad used to tell me when I was a teenager, this world does not revolve around you. Right. But we like to think that it does. And, and, and I think that and the fact that we allow our emotions to be our driving force in how we feel and our society teaches us that our feelings are what matter most and and it's we have to work even harder i think in the culture that we live in to press in and lean in and and let him increase and in us decrease because if he increases then we lose control yeah well and i and I, i'll i'll say this because i agree with what you said but i think a lot of times we'll say well follow your heart Oh, no, no. And, and the, 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 the sad reality of what so many people say that, the sad reality that we have to understand is, is that if, if, if I would say, okay, Blake, follow your heart, well, doesn't the Bible say that our heart is deceitful? Above all else. <laughs> and so, so if, I, if I'm going to follow my heart, where's that going to lead me? It's going to lead me into corruption. Yep. And, and so we, we've got to get, and, and so it goes back to, 
well, if, if this is what makes me happy, then this is what I'm going to do. But the Bible says, trust, trust not in your own self. And let, you know, you know, Philippians, you know, tells us that, not Phil, yeah, no, Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs, you know, trust not in your own, you know, trust not in your own self. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't sit there and go, well, my heart feels like I ought to do that. So when you said that, that's what just clicked in my head going, man, we say that so many times. So, trust your heart. And I'm thinking, no, I don't. I tell our teenage girls all the time, I'm like, if you are going to allow your emotions, especially at that age, to dictate your actions, then you're going to be on a roller coaster because your, your emotions change, but God never does. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to be rooted in who he is. Otherwise, you're going to just, you're going to be on a nightmare of a roller coaster. It's, it's terrible to think that, you know, if, if all my emotions, like today I could be really high, tomorrow I could be really low. And so that's God's plan. Well, no, the Bible actually lays out God's plan. There's faith, there's hope, there's love, there's, you know, several things. I mean, you can read the book of Ephesians and I mean, you know, worship, you know, there's a plan that God has. And so if, if I feel really good today, then man, I can worship God. But tomorrow, eh. yeah. I'm going to follow my heart. Well, I'm going to go over here and do this because I don't feel good. Imagine if we had marriage relationships like that. Yeah. Where, where it, you know, if you don't see, wake up and hear the birds singing and, and have, you know, love songs singing in the background, then obviously you just don't love your spouse that day. Yeah, yeah, I mean, how ridiculous yeah. is, is, yeah. is that if it's just based on emotion? Right. I agree with that. Yeah. You good with that? Uh, well, <laughs> Sorry. oh yeah, that's right. Well, because I said the pride right thing of the last question, I was like, I already answered this, but that's right. Yeah. yeah. No, and, you know exactly. That's that's the whole thing. Is it, it's a control. We we've, we've been taught that we have this control in our life, and we don't have that control. Right. We try to have it. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. we're convinced we do have. It. Absolutely. Absolutely. But so many people believe they're in charge of their life, but. And that kind of ties right back in when you were talking about um, what what hope do we have for the future. That's why people lose hope because they think they have this control in their life. The control disappears because um, it was an illusion. It was an illusion. Yeah, I, as you know, whenever um, I mean, we grieve with somebody when they lose a family member, uh -huh. but the reality is that the next morning the sun still gets up. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone still has to do their daily routines. Granted, right now we're in limbo, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the world's going to keep going. What's well, so, the daily routine today? Oh, yeah, i got to wake up and get people yeah, so. But it's still going to go. The world isn't going to stop right. because you did. Mm -hmm. Well, in the same way, when everything falls apart, that's because the, world's gonna, the world has its own plan, its own workings that it's right. going to do, right. and they're not based on you. Well, Jesus, that's why Jesus is so free, is because... Now you realize it's not under your control. Right. It's under his. Right. And we celebrate that it's under his because he has a better plan. Yeah. And his plan is going to make us a part of it. Yeah. So. And, and, and even though I, I'll hit on this too, I think we understand that, you know, again, easy to say or to do God, your plan is a lot better. But, God, I really want to do this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you thought about this? Yeah, God, you know, what can I do, God, to really, really lead me over to this direction? Because, again, we use that metaphor, but my heart really feels over here. And, and I, you know, I, I've got a book in my office, man, that, that uh, you know, we'll both be reading soon, but I've read it already. But uh, Shane Pruitt, he writes this book about nine common, you know, mistakes, I guess, as a Christian that, that we've kind of... Uh, brought up in life that we kind of live our life on. And that's one of them that he talks about is, is follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Well, how is that? That's not biblical. And so we've got to, we've got to get out of that mindset of going, well, if my heart is this way. Well, that's why the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all else. Because what's your heart going to do? Your heart's going to lead you to do the things really opposite from what God would have. So, that sinful human nature. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, just, just like the other day, I used that word to somebody. I was like, man, we're, 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 we're born sinners, so we're all we all have this total depravity where we're just all sinners. And I said, when you go back to the Garden of Eden and you look at that, God walked with Adam and Eve. He was there with them, and all of a sudden he was like, you know, he asked the question, Well, where are you? And they're like, Well, we hid ourselves. God God knew where they were. You know, but they were they deceived their heart, they went and did what they wanted to do, and 
this is where we are. So that's why the song says, turn your heart to Jesus, right. not follow your heart to Jesus. Right. I'm going to follow my heart in this direction because I'm going to do what I want to do. Like I, and I'll, I'll move on. I'll say this and then I'll move on. But I remember having a, a, a conversation one time with a person and they said, you know, I'm going to heaven. You're going to heaven and you're going to heaven. But we're all just taking different journeys because I'm going to follow my heart. And I'm thinking. Well, your journey's not going to get you there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus will, but your heart's not. So, uh, but uh, all right, number eight, we'll move forward. What's your favorite book of the Bible? Well, for me, uh, it's really hard to pick one. I got an Old Testament and a New Testament. I'll be quick. My Old Testament is Isaiah. Okay. Uh, I I feel like I, I'm more connect and more relate uh, with his. Um, with his emotional journey and his struggle with who God is and understanding that. And I don't, I'm not saying I'm a you know, prophet and see the future kind of thing, but in a sense of his understanding yeah. and how he relates to God um, and seeing the Messiah that hasn't even come and yet he's got such a clear desire and relationship with him. Um, and then in the New Testament, it's going to be Ephesians. Uh, I love Ephesians and the picture that it paints of what the church is supposed to be and uh, how we can really follow him both individually and together. And and there's some difficult passages in it, and I like watching people squirm when you hit the oh, difficult yeah. passages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's always, it's always fun when you get down um, and you start talking about predestination and, and, and the foreknowledge of God. You know, you see those people, man, they're just like, and I'm like, yeah, but if you get the background of that, you truly understand that. So, yeah. Mandy, what about you? Um, I'm kind of like Blake. I have one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. My Old Testament would have to be the book of Esther. Um, yeah. I think somebody just, I, I just love the way that God used a woman in that time period. Um, I think that just shows so much. I love the fact that she stood up against social norms. I love the fact that she was an orphan. All of those different aspects of who Esther was, even the even like what she brought to the king um, to to swoon him into marrying her. All of those things that she took the advice of an elder. I just love the story of Esther. Um, I also, in the, the New Testament, I don't know if I would say it's my favorite because it is hard, but man, when I need to really be humbled, I go to James. I love the book of James. The book of, the book of James is one that not only steps on your toes, but it makes your toes bleed. I love the fact that he's speaking to people that came from the Jewish faith that were rooted in religion and were trying to get them to look at relationship over the religion and the tradition. Um, and I love his perspective of being Jesus' brother. Right. I, I just I love the book of James. That, 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 and the, one of the things about that, too, is, is when you go back and begin to read part of the New Testament, James, even though being the half-brother of Jesus, didn't truly believe he was the Messiah. No. So then after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he saw all the, all the stuff that took place. Because, yep. you know, he even saw the miracles and still was like, oh, I don't know about this guy. But how hard would it be to believe that your brother was the Messiah? I, I mean, he's some humble pie now. Is I know. His letter, so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'd say for me, an Old Testament book for me would be be the, I've got two. I love I love uh, Psalms. I love Proverbs. Um, in reality, I do read one a day. Um, I, I read I read a Proverbs every day, and then if there's 31, you know, I, I try to I try to read it a month, um, and so I, I read those every every day. Um, I try to read a couple Psalms a day, and uh, but but New Testament man, I, I'm just a Paul fan, and so I, I would. There's a lot to choose yeah, from there. Yeah, um, I love Philippians. I love the this joy letter that he writes, you know, because, I mean, here it is. He's in prison, chained, you know, Roman soldiers every six hours. He's changing every so many hours, being beat, you know, laying there probably just naked, but being, you know, and so for me, the joy that comes out of that. Um, but uh, love the book of Acts. I love I love the start of the church. I love I love that. But, I mean, it's just hard for me to pick just one of those. So so I'd say I'm a, I'm a Paul fan, you know, from probably from Corinthians down you know, so, but, uh, all right. So when you think about reading the Bible, what's the first feeling that comes to mind? Well, 
When I first saw the question, the word that came to me was passion, but I don't, that has an emotional aspect to it that I want to back away from, and really it's a yearning. Yeah. It is this desire to go further. Um, I'm going to be honest, I struggle reading. I struggle with reading books. When I'm supposed to read a book, it, it's like, oh, I read a chapter. You know, I, I consider myself a champion and a victor because I read a whole chapter, you know. But when I get in the Bible, I just want to go more. I just want to read more. I want to keep going. I uh, have to check myself because especially when the pastor is preaching in a story part of the Bible, um, I guess that's not really true, really any part of the Bible, uh, but I guess stories and, um, or when there's a thought process that's going on, I want to keep going and seeing what the next point is and the next point is and going deeper into it. And I'm like, wait, I need to listen to what the pastor's saying. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but it's just this yearning to know it more, to understand it better. Um, a friend of mine a long time ago came out with what he called the 2020 principles. And, he's, and he said, always read 20 verses before and 20 verses after so you can get the context. And so I'm always like, I don't know that I've got enough context. And so I always want to read yeah. more and see kind of the whole picture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always one of those that I, I really, you know, even as, as, a, as preaching, I, I hate to start a verse to preach from with therefore. Like, I'm like, okay, hey, I'm going to wrap up. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, hey, for this reason, but that one there, therefore, for that re for this reason, it, it connects the verses before that. So it's kind of like, okay, what did he say before we get to that? So I'm kind of like that, too. If I, if I start a passage with therefore, I'm going to talk about something before that, you know, because it's just like it drives me bananas. And so, but uh, yeah, I, I see I'm the opposite, man. I love to read. I'm a book junkie. And so. Um, I mean, I go on. I mean, I, 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 I read a chapter of a book a day. And, and so, uh, man, I'm, I'm lucky to get through a chapter yeah, a week. <laughs> like, I'll read a chapter a day. And so, you know, the book I gave you, uh -huh. yeah, you know, I'm reading it for the second time. So, and so, I, I mean, I, I'm already done with it. And I'm reading it for the second time just so I can. What is this strange you. idea yeah. of reading a yeah. book two times? Yeah. I don't understand. And so, because I have to go back now because we talk about it. So, I mean, I have to go back and be like, okay, you know, now we have to talk about chapter two. So, I make notes about chapter two again. And so, but I am, I, and I haven't always been that way. I haven't always been to the, the point of always wanting to sit down and read. But I, I've got a passion of reading God's word that way. Like you said, you don't want to use the word passion, but I mean, I've got a a love for reading the Word of God. And that's where my mentor, Chad, that's where he come in and said, dude, you not only need to read that, but you need to read others. Um, and so um, I set a goal for myself, I guess, um, man, it had to be about 10, 12 years ago where um, I'm going to read a chapter a day. And so out of that, I, I find books either with the same chapter, like I think, what is May, 31, 31 days I think in May, so I try to find a book with 31 chapters or several books equivalent to 31. And so I read a chapter a day. So, I mean, I might be able to finish three books in a, in a month. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I'll go home and I'll play with the kids for the next hour when I get home. And, you know, before I go to bed, I'll read. I'll read. And, uh, and, and that's good and bad. I don't sleep well. I don't sleep much. But so my mind's always running. So if I'm up at 3 o'clock... Yeah, I'm, I'm doing something. So, but what do, you, what do you think? I guess I'm kind of in the middle. With me, it's either feast or famine with with reading. Um, I love to read. I, lo I love to read. But when I read, I would write notes all over what I'm reading. And and I, I'll sit and if I'm in a season of, of, of reading, I'll have like three or four books on my bedside table. And but then if I'm if I'm not in a season of where I'm hungry for that, then it'll be months before I pick up a, a book other than the Bible. Now, when it comes to the Bible, I did not grow up in church. And I'll never forget, I, oh, like, one of the worst things that you could ever, like, one of the worst, um, like, disses you could give me is to call me stupid. Yeah. Or to make me feel stupid. I just, oh, that's a pet peeve, right? 
And I was sitting in youth group and they were like, okay, we're going to be in, I don't know, we're going to say Ephesians chapter whatever today. And everybody's getting their Bibles out and everybody's looking. And I had no idea what Ephesians was. I had no idea there were chapters and verses. I knew very, very little about the Bible and I felt stupid. And it gave me a really nasty taste in my mouth for studying God's word for a long time because I did not feel like I was smart enough to do it. So at first, I read the Bible just to understand it, just so I wouldn't feel like I didn't know things. And um, like even little Bible stories that you learn in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school class, I didn't know that. And some of those things, sadly, I learned as Elena was a baby and we were going through those things. I was like, oh my goodness. Like I didn't really realize that Noah did all that. I just knew about an ark. Like, yeah. whoa, this story has much more depth. And now as I'm older and in a different season, I can say that I, I have that yearning and that reading the Bible brings intimacy with between me and God in a lot of ways. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I see I was that way. Like I wasn't raised in church. So I got saved at 18 and so I started reading the Bible. And I mean, here it is. I'm sitting in a men's Sunday school class, uh, small church. Um, the, I'm the youngest, and I think the oldest was, I don't know, I'm going to say like 70 something. You know, and these people are, you know, talking about this. And, and somebody was like, Well, you remember Zacchaeus? And I'm like, Who's Zacchaeus? Yeah. You know, they're like, Yeah, he's a wee little man. And, I'm, and then somebody starts singing it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man. So I'm like, You people are crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I know. Or, yeah. or like, this was something I completely missed out yeah. on. You know, and, and, I, and I think that we as a church have to be. I think that has given me a different perspective. Sure. Um, sure. When you talk to new Christians, when you talk to people that weren't raised in the church, to to be able to yeah. realize, you, you can come to me, I get it. <laughs> I, I was and, with you. And I think too, that, that goes not only from that aspect of, of uh, Bible knowledge, I think church lingo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hey, let's go on down to the uh, WMU That's or right. let's go on down to this or that. You know, you've got those new Christians that are going, what in the world the WMU mm -hmm. or what is, you know, what is the RAs or what is the GAs? What, what is all that? We, and fellowship with me. Yeah, <laughs> we've got to get to the point where new people are going to come to the church. And that's the other thing that I wanted to say earlier, and I forgot till just now. But that's what gives me future for uh, hope for the future, too, is, is knowing that when we start meeting back together, we're going to have a bunch of people that's never been in church before that, that would look at that and go, I don't have a clue where that's at. I don't care. About, what, are, what are they talking about? So church lingo, there, there's this lingo that we have that you just look at and go, the rest of the world doesn't talk that way. Well, and like, you know, like for example, the offering and the tithe, and someone's like, well, that person doesn't tithe, and you have to step back and go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Whoever taught them, right. how, do they even know what that means? Right. Right. And so these, all these different ideas, it's okay, and we need to realize it's okay as the church when people don't understand these things and be excited to, to, teach. to, to teach them. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, when she's talking about learning stuff, I still remember the first time we talked about uh, David's sons and the relationship between them. And she looks at me and she goes, did you know this was in here? I was, I was just like, this is so cool. Yeah. Well, it's like I got saved and, and I remember the, the first church that I was on staff at was a small church, but then I remember going as a youth pastor to, to my next church and I remember walking back to the nursery and it was like all done in Noah's Ark and, and I mean and they're all excited about it and I'm just like guys do y'all know what happened know. like you've got Noah's Ark all over the wall and like God flooded the earth and it's a very like, morbid on. nursery yes. and I'm like you guys are kind of crazy <laughs> but every church that I've ever been in yeah. the whole nursery is that way and it's just kind of like okay like do you guys understand like <laughs> what took place y'all want to go back and get your Bible and understand that, you know, God said, I wish I'd never made man in my image. I'm going to kill y'all. Yeah. So, I mean, I was talking about that this and week. And he did kill most Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right, last question, and we'll wrap this up. If you could give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, I'll let you go first. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, okay. Sucker. A lot. No. Um, my first one would be, don't be so hard on yourself. 
Um, I was, a perf I am, I still struggle with perfectionism and, and, and being really hard on myself when I, I say I'm sorry and apologize for more things than until my sorries don't even mean anything. Um, so stop being so hard on yourself. I think the second thing is um, stop worrying so much about the future that you don't enjoy today. So I was a weird kid. I mean, I wore, I didn't want to be a kid. I wanted to be an adult. I, I wore business suits to middle school. Oh yeah, really did. Uh, I was weird. Yeah, mm -hmm. Business suits. Uh huh. Yeah, she didn't tell me about that until after the wedding. That's right. You didn't see those pictures, just like I didn't see your mullet pictures. Whoa! Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're letting all of that go. Stabbing in the heart. That's okay. I had a mullet one time before I lost all my hair. <laughs> so now I thought about growing it out to have a skull. But that's <laughs> No, but, but, but really, just don't it, for, forget to enjoy today because you're so stressed about tomorrow. And, and lastly, it's all going to be okay. Like, I've, I've read the next chapter. You're, you're going to be okay. Yeah. God's going to get you through it. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that, that so many people um, live life, and Jesus talked about it over and over again. You know, hey, you remember you remember the story in in, in, in the, even in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where where Jesus um, talked about you know, hey, didn't doesn't the birds of the air doesn't the you know the, the the birds of the air and all that have a place to go? You know, if if Jesus would give birds and foxes and and place and, you know animals a place to sleep, even in the wild, and he he created that for them, how much more is he going to take care of us? Yeah. And I'm reminded about that every day, you know, because I mean, I, I do worry about certain things and, 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 you know, I stress over certain things. And at the end of the day, I sit down and go, I can't change that, you know, and, and the older I get, you know, it's kind of like, man, I, the only thing I can do at this point is pray. I can't do anything else. But it's like, okay, I'm going to worry about it for the next 10 hours, yeah. and then I'm going to pray. Exactly. And, and God's like, hey, why don't you stop worrying about it and then just pray, you know, for the first hour. And, um, and so, yeah, you've, you've got to enjoy life. And, um, and that's something that I've come to realize, you know, several years ago. And I'm just going to enjoy life. You know, I'm going to have fun and I'm going to enjoy it so, all I can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the biggest thing I would tell myself uh, is to talk. Um, I know, it's shocking, but when, this uh, is true. <laughs> I have, I have. When, when I was young, I was, I was so scared of how people would take me. Sure. It, it was phobic. I mean, it was to that point. And, I, and so I completely shut down and completely withdrew. And I didn't talk to people. I didn't share what was on my heart. And uh, there's two massive failures that have come out of that. First off was I missed a lot of relationships that I could have had and people that were there for me. This is, I, this is a totally self uh, plug here, but I had a youth minister who wanted to be there for me, yeah. who wanted to invest in my life, who wanted to show me that someone cared and I wouldn't let him in. Um, and I look back and realize just how bad, just how much I missed out. And in turn, that's why, that's what I do what I do. And that's why I want to be, I, I, you know, so yes, total self plug here uh, for our students. If they're watching this, you know, I'm not here for a paycheck and I'm not here to make people I'm happy. I'm here expressly to know you and to pour into you and to help you on that journey. But the other thing that I realized was I missed, I missed some very purposeful opportunities that God gave me to tell others about Jesus because I was so withdrawn and so focused on myself and so worried about how others would take what I had to say that I wouldn't tell them about Jesus. And that's one of those things that will stick with me to the grave. It's just this realization that I blew it in other people's sure. lives. And I know that God is going to do what God's going to do, and he used other people, but I missed out on being part of his mission Absolutely. and his ministry. Yeah. So. Well, 
Well, that's good. That's good. Y'all have anything else you want to share real quick before we, we close? Join us for Porch Praise on Friday at 7. Porch Praise Friday. That's right. Yeah. On Saturday, we're going to have a family game night, and you'll hear lots more about that, but that'll be a lot of fun. Um, we really do miss you. Shane opened with that. I'll close with that. Like, yeah. we really miss you. We love you. We pray for you every day. And, um, man, I want to come out of this a better person than I went into it. Yeah, and I think I think there are some things, and, I, and that's been my prayer that for our church family, um, that this has taught us, you know, something that that, and I think God has a purpose in it. Um, of of one, I look back at our our theme and go, okay, how faithful have we been away from the building? Mm -hmm. We have to realize that this is the building. This is just this. When when God returns, it's not going to be here. Um, but we're the church. Mm -hmm. And as the church, have we learned to be more faithful to God in the midst of being away and being out so we can be that hands and feet of God? You know, one of the things that I'll, I'll close with this, but one of the things that has birthed um, in this pandemic and, and in this um, Corona uh, COVID-19 stuff, one of the things that it's done for First Baptist Church is, is it's, it's birthed a new ministry. Um, you know, each Wednesday we have handed out food. Each Wednesday we have um, handed out um, just over the last couple of weeks. I know, I think I, think I was told um, yesterday, I think it was, that we've handed out over a thousand meals just in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, last, last week I think we did right at 300 meals. The week before we did like 306 or 307. Um, and so we've, we've actually had people... Um, donate um, money to go to a ministry that is going to be birthed out of this to say, hey, to be the hands and feet. I know our missions team has worked together and said, hey, can we keep doing this? Not every Wednesday, but can we do it once a month? And so church family, just know that, that we have a new ministry um, that was birthed out of this that God is saying, hey, I'm faithful. And so even though we, we look at things and go, man, I've just been at home, we have taken meals to people's homes. Um, some of our, our senior adults, some of our shut-ins, some of our widows, we've taken it to them. And, and that's what we need to be about. Um, we need to be about being the hands and feet. There's other mission opportunities that um, I was talking to our mission, mission team's chairman just the other day and, and just some of the opportunities that we have coming up. And so, you know, I think if we could pray for one thing, it's that, hey, that we, we as a church, we as a body of Christ could do one thing. That's to make a difference in the community. Sure. You know, that's where connecting to the church, the home and the community is all about. That we as a church, even though we're not meeting physically, you know, we're not together. We're not, you know, we understand what Hebrews 10.25 says. Don't forsake the assembly of meeting together. Hey, that don't have to be physically. That could be still on the Internet, online. We have to understand, too, that what we're doing is reaching hundreds and hundreds of people. Out of that, we've, we've made contacts of people that we know that when we start physically meeting back, where we can go now visit them and start inviting them to church. And so that's what I want to ask our church family to pray for, that, that these people that we have reached out to, that one, that we might be able to take that next step in the next couple weeks and, and just go... Um, we, we want to go to their houses, invite them when all this is over. So, uh, But with that, Blake, you want to close us in prayer? Absolutely. And before I do, one quick thing. Um, there's a meme that I keep seeing that says uh, if I, uh, that I always thought I didn't clean my house because I was too busy. I've realized now that's not the reason. Yeah. Make sure that you're not falling in the trap of I, the reason I never got serious about my relationship with Christ and I never pursued him was because I was too busy. And now I'm finding out that's not the reason either. Right. Make sure you're pursuing him. We've got our church at home opportunities uh, all throughout the week. You can check it on our website. You can call the church. We'll get you plugged in with stuff. But don't let this be a time where God's not in the picture. That's good. So no, that's good. Because I think, I think it, it is, man. I think you're right. And, and I don't have much to say about that. But too many times 
we get in that aspect of saying, I'm too busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In reality, we make ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been lots of times that I'll confess that I've said, man, I'm just too busy to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you over here. Don't be that way. Yeah. So go ahead. Pray. All right, so let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Amen. Thank you for a presence that we don't deserve, for a presence that is beyond our understanding. Lord, you are so much more than we could ever put our hands or our mind around. And yet you continue to pour yourself out. And so with humility, we lay ourselves before you. And Lord, we pray that you would use us to your name's sake, Lord, to your glory. Lord, that we would be passionate to pursue you, that we would be passionate to share you. And Lord, that we would come out of this time closer to you and intent on pursuing you every day of our life. Lord, we pray that you would use this church to your glory. We pray that this church would stand for you and would share you with everyone they come in contact with. Lord, do we want to commit our homes to you. We pray that during this time that it's not just let's see how much Netflix we can get in, but God, that we'll be intentional about sharing what God's doing in our lives, that we would pray in front of each other and hear each other have that relationship with you. And Lord, we want to commit this community to you. Lord, as you provide healing for those that are sick, Lord, as you provide opportunities for those who have lost their jobs, as you provide a way for us to come out of this, and not just come out of it, but come out of it closer and stronger. We pray that all of this would be in your name. We love you. Amen. Amen. Bye, guys.